Welcome to this God-inspired message from Shofar Christian Church. Enjoy today's message. May you experience the presence of our Father and may you grow deeper in your relationship with Him. Jesus, thank you that we know you hear our prayer, Lord. That it's your desire for all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of this truth, Lord. And so we pray that across this city, the name of Jesus will be lifted high, Lord. That across the city, there would be a calling on the name of Jesus. Across the city, there would be a wave of repentance and a turning to you, Jesus. Across this city, that men and women, young and old, will step into love as they call on your name, Lord. We pray for salvation to spring up, Lord God. We pray that there just would be a wave of salvation, Lord, of souls and lives being turned from darkness into light. In Jesus' name, amen. Fantastic. Thank you so much for praying with us. Let's keep praying always, but particularly in this month as we're fasting. Tomorrow night, we're going to be praying together. Come and join us for that. And... I'm expecting God to do some significant things in our lives during this month of fasting. I'm not sure about you, if there's someone else with an expectation, but I've got an expectation. I've got an expectation this is not just going to be another month, maybe even another fast. This is going to be a time, a month of fast in which we meet with the living God, in which He shapes and forms something of Himself within us. I mentioned in a week, for those who are not on our WhatsApp community group, two years ago I did a whole series on fasting and why fasting and some thoughts around biblical fasting. We're not going to repeat that every year as we fast, but it is important. And so perhaps if you missed those messages, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to those messages. Why do we fast? What did Jesus say about fasting? What does fasting do? Why is fasting important? Those are all really, really good questions. And would love perhaps every year to teach about all of those things. Um, I just felt this year not to reteach them. Those messages are available. But for this year specifically in our time of fasting to take some time talking about specifically some of the things that I believe God is stirring in our heart and some of the things that we are fasting about. And the first one that I want us to look at this morning a little bit is that Jesus is a builder. I love building, and I love builders. It's before we sort of look too much at, not too much, I don't think you could ever look too much at the text, but before we sort of get stuck into the Word, just the idea of the heart. I love that Jesus, and some people don't like it when we say this, but when Jesus came, He never came as a revolutionary. He came as a reformer. What do I mean by that? I mean, He did not come to upend and to throw out the old, but He came to take which was already and to build upon it. He took the law as an example. He says, I didn't come to to cast out the law, to throw away the law, to cancel the law. And so much today of our, our modern social action is all about cutting off, casting away, throwing, and starting from scratch. And I love how God, throughout Scripture and throughout the ages, never does that. Here and there, there are a few moments of deep sin, of brokenness. For example, in the flood where he comes and he just cancels and he restarts. But as a whole, as a rule, God is a God of redemption and a God of reformation where he takes something as broken as it is and he takes the beauty within it and he builds upon that. And he puts layer upon layer. And that's the heart and the nature of God. If you read the Old Testament, specifically the New Testament as well, both Testaments, but particularly in the New Testament, you'll see the language of God is the language of a builder. He builds, He shapes, He creates. We see, for example, in Matthew 16 where He says, Now I say to you that you are Peter. And this is a little bit of a play on words that's happening here. What's happened is um, there were... Jesus has just said to Peter and to his disciples, who did people say I am? And they have a little discussion. They say, some people say you are this, some people say you are that. Other people are thinking along these lines. And Jesus looks at his disciples 
specifically his 12 closest friends. And Peter is sort of the spokesperson, in a sense, amongst them. And he says, but who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And exactly the Christ and all the terminology in Bible school, we sort of dig into all of these words, what they mean, why they're important. And he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds, and he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because this isn't knowledge that's come from flesh and blood, but God himself has revealed that to you. And then this is where we pick up, that's all up to verse 17, verse 18, he says, now I say that you are Peter, and the name Peter means rock. Some of us miss this. Peter's name wasn't Peter. Peter's mom never called Peter, Peter. Peter's brother, Andrew, never called him Peter. At least not until Jesus came onto the scene. They called him Simon. And Simon, which means reed, means one with no stability, one that is blown to and fro by the wind. And Jesus, as an example, steps into Peter's life, and he begins to build into Peter's life. And the first way he does that is he says, I'm not going to call you reed anymore. That's derogatory. I'm going to call you rock. You are solid. You are dependable. You are a man of character. And so Jesus looks at him and he says, you are Peter. You are rock. And on this rock, some church traditions understand that to mean that on this rock of Peter, and I think Peter is the rock on which the church was built. Most of the Reformed church today, we don't think that's what Jesus meant there. He said, you are a rock but on a greater rock, on the rock that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church. And all of the powers of the hell will not conquer. So here we see just a beautiful picture of Jesus, the builder. Jesus saying, I am going to build something precious and beautiful in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4, I don't think I put that in our slides as a, a beautiful phrase, beautiful sentence. It says, for every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. Every house has a builder, but the one who builds everything is God. You see, God in His nature, God in His being is a builder. A little bit later, we're going to see that Jesus speaks himself of himself as the chief cornerstone, the, the foundation, the building block upon which everything else is built. We read in Scripture that he speaks about one of his parables, one of them that we all know. We hear about it when we're kids. He says, if you build a house on sand, the flood comes and it won't stand. But if you build a house on a rock, then the wind and the waves and the storm can come and it will stand. And we see all of these pictures, all of these stories of building. It's part of Jesus' vocabulary. Part of who He is is He is a builder. And very specifically in Matthew 16, He says, one thing I am going to build, I'm going to build my church. I will build my church. Hopefully most of us know this once again. We do whole modules about this in Bible school. I want to encourage you to strongly consider doing Bible school if you haven't done Bible school yet. But just for a, a quick recap for us here, the word he uses there is a word ecclesia. And he's not saying I'm going to build a building as beautiful as this building is. And we thank God for people many years ago who gave obviously sacrificially and liberally of their time and effort and energies to build a building like this and like these, many like this across the country and the countries where we can gather today. We honor them for their sacrifice. But Jesus didn't come and say, I'm going to build a whole bunch of buildings across the planet. He also didn't say, I'm going to build an organization. I'm going to build this structure. It's important we'll touch on it. It's not bad that there is a structure. But he, that's not what he focuses on when he says, yeah, I'm going to build my church. When he says, I'm going to build my church, he says, I'm going to build a community, an authentic community of faith, a family, a, a people who gather together around my name. And later on, we would understand around the cross. That is what he means when he says, I will build my church. 
When he says he will build his church, he is not looking at the building. He is not looking at the structure and the organization. Even though every family needs a home, having a home, having a building is great. And every family, we need some form of structure to make sure that kind of this family just operates semi-healthily and kind of that all of the dishes don't just pile up because there isn't some form of structure of how we deal with our dishes and how do we make food and how do we get the kids to school in the morning. That all speaks about structure and structure is necessary in a healthy family. But that's not what makes our family. Our family isn't defined by who takes the kids to school in the morning and who picks them up. Our family isn't defined by who makes meals and who mows the lawn. Our family isn't defined by Who does the washing and where do we hang the washing and how do we do the ironing? That's not what defines our family. It's crucial to our family, but that's not what makes us. What makes us a family is the bond of love that binds us together. And so Jesus says, I will build my church, a community. And I want to just stress it because so often in the world today, we miss that you and I are the church that Jesus is building. And so we take the building away and you and I will remain and the church will remain. It's another thing that's interesting. There is nothing that's been around for the last 2,000 years that's still around today. The Roman Empire has come and gone. Multiple other empires, entire kind of generations and legacies have come and gone. Nothing else remains. The one thing that has remained is the church of Jesus. The only thing that has remained. It's interesting if you go just kind of, because it's, it's pretty easy to do, if you go and find all of the companies in the United States that were around 100 years ago, we're not even talking about 2,000 years, 100 years ago, only a handful, if that, of them still remain today. That's just the last 100 years, and yet the church endures and is still here. Not the building, not the organization, not the structure, but a community of people who follow Jesus. And so if we're looking at Jesus, the builder, there are three primary ways and through which Jesus builds relating to people. The first one is Jesus builds people. First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, As you come to Him, that's to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. So, People didn't accept Jesus the way that we should have, but in the sight of God, Jesus is precious. He says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. See, the first place where Jesus builds is he builds you and he builds me. He takes people, he takes broken, ordinary, confused people, perhaps Simons tossed to and fro by the wind. Simon, when any wave comes, the we, uh, the reed just kind of bends over. Some of us aren't even reeds. We're weeds. We're just unwanted. Just There's nothing good in us. And Jesus takes that and he builds and he shapes and he forms and he creates beauty out of ashes. He builds people. He wants to build you. He's building you and me all the time. He never stops building. It's not like God builds, you know, he looked at Peter and he built Peter up to him. I said, now I'm happy with Peter. I'm going to stop building. I'm never going to build Peter again. No, he is continually, always building, shaping, forming. I think we place too much emphasis on it in, in modern church about being the best me that I can be. We write books all about that. I think it's profoundly unbiblical because I'm not interested in being the best Philip I can be. I'm simply interested in being the best follower of Jesus I can be. But yet in that there is something of what God has placed inside of me that I must embrace and that I must hold on to and trust that God will build. So God, is, as much as I am not interested in being the best Philip I can be, the crazy thing is Jesus is interested in making me the best Philip I can be. My heart is about being more like Him and less like me, and yet He is interested and committed to building me, but in building me, to be building, to 
build me more like him and not more like me, if that makes sense. John the Baptist said so beautifully just before Jesus arrived. He says, I must be the best me I can be. No. He said, I must decrease. And Jesus must increase. And so God is committed to building you. He's not committed to building you according to your template and according to your plan and according to your vision and your dreams. No, He's committed to building you according to His character and His nature. He's in the first invitation that He holds before the disciples. He says to the twelve initially when He starts calling them individually, He says, come to me and I will make you. I will build you. I will form you. I will shape you. You are not what you need to be, but that's okay. I will make you what you need to be. And so the first thing Jesus does is he builds us. I wanted to say this at the beginning. We're going to sort of this morning have in the message, there's going to be two parts. The first part is we're going to look at, we're going to get quite theological and just look at Jesus, the builder, a little bit. And then we're going to get super practical about it. So we're going to build a nice theological framework and then get really, really practical. The first one is that Jesus builds people. He builds you and he builds me. In Jude chapter 1 verse 20, this same principle sort of gets carried through. It says, but you, dear friends, you must build each other up in your most holy faith. By praying in the power of the Holy Spirit, we must build one another up. The word in the English that we use for this is the word edify. And many of the Bibles would have it. We need to edify, build one another up. Stuch is the Afrikaans. We want to be shaping and building each other up. Prophecy is meant to edify one another. It's meant to build us up because God is committed to building people. First thing that God does is He builds people. Not only does Jesus build people, but then He builds with people. First, he makes living stones, and he makes beautiful stones. If you want to imagine this building all around, every one of us, we are one of these little bricks, except we are living bricks. We are living stones, which he is shaping and forming and creating for his glory. And he builds those stones. Some wanted to go and make every one of these bricks. And so Jesus does that. He makes the bricks. He builds the stones. The next thing he does is he builds with those stones. He takes you and me and he builds us together. See an example of this in Ephesians 2. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That right there is sort of a central thought of the whole of the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a book that the apostle Paul also, that wasn't his name originally, um, he writes to a church. And the church is in Ephesus, and the whole church, there's probably not a single Jew in the whole church. They are all what we would know today, call today Gentiles. They're not Jewish, they don't come from a Jewish heritage. And so the whole, so they're wrestling with this thing. There are the Jews in their mind, God's chosen people, and then there are the rest. And the whole book of Ephesians is all about there is no more than there are the rest. We are all part of God's chosen people. So it's six chapters. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians sort of get summarized by this, but you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are not separate from the people of God. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's sort of the the entire first half of the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters. And the next three chapters are because you are Members and citizens of the household of God. This is how you should act. But that's the first bit. But he carries on. He says, you are part of the body of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And so here we see this beautiful picture that every single one of us, we are, the Bible refers to us as temples of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in you and in me if we are followers of Jesus. We are in that sense, 
New Testament temples, carriers of the presence of God. What we also see, though, is God doesn't only build into me privately, individually, by myself. It's all about me. You know, we serve the Holy Trinity, me, myself, and I. You know. And so we're going through this place, and we're in this world where it's all about me, myself, and I. And Jesus comes and He says, no, it's not all about me, myself, and I. It's about a community. You are together being built into a temple. So yes, individually, privately, I am a temple. But at the same time, God is taking all of these, in a sense, mini temples, little temples, all of these living stones, all of these living bricks, every one of these little pieces of building material that He's shaping, that He's fashioning, and He begins to put them together. There's a word that's used here, interesting, in Scripture that some people in modern church want to hate. And he says here, in whom the whole structure, this entire thing coming together is being joined together. It grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And so you and I are holy temples of the Lord individually. But we grow into a holy temple of the Lord when we take hands together and we allow God to join us together and to put structure together, to bring us together in place. And when the one brick begins to become a building, it becomes a temple for the Lord. So we see Jesus builds people. Secondly is He builds with people. He uses us as the building blocks for that which, is he, which He is building. And then thirdly for us this morning, He builds through people. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes and he, he says, We are both God's workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. The previous point, you are the building that God is building. Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. So yes, Jesus came to say, I will build my church. And the way in which Jesus builds his church is he builds people. Those people that he is building, he uses to build communities with those people. And then within those communities, he builds through people. He says, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have. And he goes on to say how important it is to build right because a fire is coming and only that which kind of blasts through the fire will endure. And Ephesians, we see the same principle. He says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. You see, God comes and He takes you as an individual and He begins to build you. As He is building you, He takes you as a building block and He knits you together. He, but this messel in Afrikaans, He... What is Messel in English? Where the building people, where the walking dictionaries. Right? He builds you together. He takes. Oh, suddenly, my English is just. My airtime has run out. What do you call. Not Daga, Daga. What's the proper name for that? Mortar. He takes mortar and he takes the very. There we go. You ask the QS. He should know these things. And he takes the mortar and he, he takes your stone and he puts some mortar and he joins another stone. And the beautiful thing about that, you might have missed this. That's pretty hard to break. And the mortar that holds us together is this love of God together with the, the character of God, the nature of God. He says to us in John, I think it's John 15, he says, the same glory that I have received God, I give to them, and that's the glory, God, which made you and me be one. I give to them so that they can be one. And so it's the glory of God which is this mortar that holds us together. 
that shapes, that takes my little stone and your little stone and Birgit's little stone and Marcus' stone and Nicole's stone and brings them all together and shapes them into something that he sees is glorious. And then he takes some of us and he says, I'm going to use you as a builder. So not only are you a stone that's being kind of glued together, stuck together to other stones, and you become like this bigger temple for His glory, I'm actually going to give you hands to go and fetch and shape and build other stones. And as you're building those other stones to be the hands and feet that take that stone and stick them into the wall and build higher and higher again. And so we see God as a builder. Building people, building with people, building through people. But as much as he's building through people, I believe right in that is an invitation for you and I to become builders. See, Christianity, in a sense, is very simple. We just follow Jesus. We literally just follow Jesus. What that looks like, sadly, has led to literal wars and people killing one another over the centuries gone by. There are so many disagreements about how exactly should we follow Jesus. But I believe one of the things, is because there's a spectrum, you know, I I can follow Jesus, I can wake up in the morning and I can have a nice quiet time and I can go through my day and maybe do something nice for someone and go to bed. And tomorrow the same and the next day the same and the next day the same. I guess that's following Jesus. I can wake up in the morning and I can say, Jesus, how do I build your house today? How do I do what brings you glory? How do I take this body as a living sacrifice and lay it down and say, every moment of every day, Jesus, I want to commit it to your glory. And tonight when I go to bed, I want to ask Jesus, did I bring you glory? Did I build your house? Did I build your people? Did I invest and sow into the lives that you're committed to Jesus? Did I do something about the blood of Jesus, justice, and the way I live my life today? That's also following Jesus. And I guess we're all at different stages and different walks and how we follow Jesus. And if somebody comes to me and says, I just want to know Jesus, and it's all about, you know, part of me will be I'm totally okay with it. I'm going to trust God for grace to build into your life. At the same time, I know that that's not how I want to follow Jesus. I don't want to follow Jesus just being able to put a little tick box at the end of the day. I did my Christian duty. I want to live a life filled with the glory and the knowledge of Jesus, led by the Holy Spirit, doing crazy things for His name. And so... As a church, I want to invite us because I believe God is inviting us even through this fast to rethink how you and I are being built internally. How God is building with us and how we are actively engaged in building others. And so for us as a church, flipping over, for, for flipping over a little bit from the theological side of, of this morning to the practical side, what does that look like? How do we build? Well, we build in community. For us, that's an absolute non-negotiable because God has never called any of us to be an island. He hasn't called us to be, to live by ourselves. Sort of at the most, most basic level, He's called us to love my neighbor. Have you ever realized you cannot love your neighbor when you're by yourself? Although some of us, we think our neighbors would love us more if they would just turn their music off. But, you know, in practice... We cannot love our neighbor if we don't have a neighbor. So at the very core, at the very basic fundamental understanding of our faith, it's about how do we live with other people. And we express our love to Christ and how we express our love to other people. Community is central to our faith. So for us, uh, the core place, and as we go through this, none of these are sort of... this. The only place where this happens is a lot of cross-pollination. There's a bunch of stuff happening in a bunch of different environments. But the primary place where we are trusting God to develop authentic relationships is in small groups. What do I mean by that? 
I mean, even as we're a, a smallish group here, a smallish church as such, and I can try and know what's going on in every one of your lives. The reality is there is so much going on in your life that right now, as you sit here, I have no idea about. Maybe if it's your spouse sitting next to you, they sort of know, but the person sitting next to them, sitting next to them they don't really know. But if we can get together in smaller groups, a group of five or six people, and we can commit to do life together, to be transparent with one another, to be honest with one another, to be vulnerable with one another, we're beginning to grow authentic community. And so it's unrealistic to expect that everybody here is going to know exactly what's going on in one another's lives and praying for everything all the time and totally be excited about your job interview tomorrow or totally be praying with you about the the report that you need to submit or the big decision you need to make or the person you're meeting, whatever it is. But there's no reason why there can't be a small group of people who are completely bought in to your life. And so for us, it's key to build in community. And so not only do we want to build you in community, we want to build you as a disciple. We want to see you growing as how in your ability, in your capacity in following Jesus. The primary place where that happens is in our encounter series. I mentioned there's a, a life encounter happening on the 2nd of March, a, a place where we have an opportunity to stand still around the basic principles of the faith. Encounter one is about basically what does it mean to follow Jesus practically? What does that look like? Encounter two, three, and four are significant ministry areas we've identified over the years where people need an understanding of God's ways and a place for them to engage with that, receive healing around that. Second one specifically about community, a little, some of the things we're touching about this morning, about how do I relate to team and people around us and leadership and all of those things. The third one is about family and background and history and identity and the who am I question. The fourth one is about stepping into the spiritual dimension and the reality of demonic powers and oppressions and strongholds and dealing well with them. Every one of those are structured to bring healing to you as a person but also to empower you to deal with it tomorrow. Because tomorrow, guess what? You're going to go to work and you're going to have the same brokenness poured at you. And the idea isn't to come back to a seminar to receive healing all the time. It's to understand the grace of God in that space. The fifth one is about how do I share what God has built into my life? We want to build you as a disciple. We want to build you as a leader. Bible school is a primary space for that, a place where we can lead with confidence based on the Word of God. The Word of God is central. And, you know, I would put it here under leadership, but I actually believe every single believer should do Bible school. And the reason I say that is because how can I authentically follow Jesus if I've never taken time to just at least study the Word? Just to go and read the and study and learn the important themes that run through Scripture and how do they relate to my life. Most of us, as we're sitting here, if we haven't done some form of Bible school, there are a couple of topics we know really well. Then there are a few we think we know really well. And then there are a couple that we probably haven't even thought of. Something like Bible school helps us to have a, a grounded understanding across the spectrum. Not everything but give us a foundation from which to go. And I want to encourage you, do Bible school because we want to build you as a leader. We want to build you as a minister. We want to build you as somebody who can minister to others. The primary place, place where this happens is in our Let's Go teams. This year, I said at the start of the year, I want to repeat it, we're putting our faith out, we're sitting down as a, as a team, we're planning we want every single person in this church to go on at least one mission team this year. You know, about two or three weeks, we'll give you a breakdown of where we wanted to send different teams, how much it's going to cost, what the dates are, all of those things. But we want to trust God that every single one of us would go on at least one mission at some stage during this year. Somewhere where I can step out of my comfort zone, somewhere where I can be pressed a little bit, somewhere where I can be challenged a little bit to minister to other people. 
We want to see you grow in community, grow as a disciple, grow as a leader, grow as a minister. The first time we read that, it's, and it's not wrong at all. We see, I want to grow in, in all of those things, definitely. And then it becomes a little bit like a spiral, this spiral flow of maturity, of growth. And what begins to happen, hopefully, when we embrace being more of a minister is we change the word there a little bit. And it doesn't become about, we want to build. I don't want to be built in community. I'm, I'm still being built in community, but I want to see people being built in community. And so I start going to small group a little bit differently. I don't only go to small group because I want to grow in community. I start going to small group because I want to see the people around me grow in community. I don't only go to Bible school because I or encounters because I want to grow as a disciple. I start serving at the encounters because I want to see people growing as a disciple. I go to Bible school and I attend Bible school and I start teaching at Bible school and I start taking some of those modules and teaching them in other places because I want to see people grow as leaders. And I start leading and organizing and planning missions teams, not just because I want to grow as a minister, but I want to see other people grow as ministers. So I want to invite you this year. I want to encourage you this year. Let's be a church that builds people. Firstly, and I want to say this again because I'm speaking on two levels, and sometimes when we do that, it, it almost sounds like I'm discounting the one. I'm not discounting the first one at all. We want to build you. Our heart, our desire is to see you being built. I want to encourage you, get yourself equipped, do the encounters, attend Bible school. Trust the Holy Spirit to build you, to develop a heart for others and Here's where the spiral becomes really beautiful and it kicks in. The stronger you are, the better you're able to build other people. The more you've allowed God to build you, the more you can build into other people. Building well is a team effort. See, as God is building together, He isn't putting individual things all over and says, Philip, you build there and... David, you build there, and Monica, you build there. No, he puts us together. He says, guys, I'm going to allow you to build together. It's a team effort. And so with all of those things being said, and next week we'll expand a little bit more on that, I want to invite you in this fasting time to pray about something. Three things, rather, in this next week, and I want to ask that for this next week of prayer, we make this our prayer focus. We pray together about us as a church. How are we building people? Pray for grace that we may build people. Pray for grace that we may reach people, that we may find people, that we may draw people so we can build people for Jesus. The first point of prayer for this coming week is part of our fast. Pray about how are we building people. Secondly, pray about how are we building community. How are we building with those people, all of those people? How are we bringing them together, connecting them together, binding them together for the glory of God? Pray for greater grace to do it well for His name and for His glory. And then the third one, we're going to pray about what is my role as a builder? How is God building through me? What is it that I can do? What is the bit that I can add? If God is building in me, it's beautiful. And not only is He building in me, He's building me and He's adding me together with other people. And it's just glorious what God is building. And God, how is it that, where do you want me to extend my hands to? Where do you want my feet to walk to, to start building for you? I'm going to ask the ushers to pass the elements of the communion out. We're going to have communion together as we close, as we pray. And so what I don't want us to do today is anybody to put their hand up and say, Philip, I want to build here. Philip, I want to build there. Philip, I think God is calling me to build there. What I do want to ask is that we go and we pray about it. By the end of this week, maybe, but by the end of this month, hopefully as we're 
putting this month to pray and fast together, we're going to have some clarity about what is it that God has called me to do for a couple of reasons. Number one, it makes leading so much easier. See, if someone comes to me and says, hey, I've been called to serve. Oh, I've been called to serve in this capacity. Maybe God has spoken to me. He wants me to lead worship. Easy one to pick. Then I've got no problem picking a phone and say, listen, will you come and lead worship here and here and here? And obviously I've got respect for capacity, but I don't have problems asking people to do what God's called them to do. Then it's easy to lead. What's hard to lead is if I've got to find someone who wants to come and lead worship because there's no one who senses in their heart that God has called them to lead worship. Then you're doing it for me, and I've got to encourage and inspire and motivate you. But if God has spoken to you, you're going to do it so much healthier and better, and it's just going to be a more wholesome environment for everyone. So I want to invite you to pray about how can I build. Practically, what we want to invite you to do is there are a couple of places where we build. I mentioned some of them now, and I see some of you already are. You can scan that image on the screen. That's going to take you to a little form. If you don't want to scan the image on the screen, on the WhatsApp community, there's a group there that says, there we go, get in it. I want to be a builder. It'll take you to roughly the same place, the same answer we get. Don't want you to answer it now. I want you to go and pray about it. There are a couple of places, a couple of teams. We have different teams. And so what I invite you is, I think this is reasonable. I understand we all have very different capacities. And I've got an incredible amount of respect for that. What I want to invite you to do, what I want to ask you to pray about, is two places where we serve. What do I mean by two? One on a Sunday and one somewhere else. So there's one thing, one team that I'm part of on a Sunday as we build this house. And once again, we're not building this house just for me. Thank you. We're not building this house for you. We're building this house because it's a community, because it's a group of people coming together. And so why do we greet people at the door? Well, we want every single person who comes to feel welcome. We want them to know that this is a place where God wants them to be. We want them to be here, but more than that, we want to say God wants you to be here, and you're welcome here this morning. So we want people standing at the door with a smile, with that conviction in their heart. I'm welcoming people to the house of God this morning. So we've got a bunch of different teams that do things along those lines, and in this week we'll communicate to you some of those, what they are um, on the WhatsApp group and on our social media. And they're on those lists, those things that you're scanning now, and on the, um, the community group as well. One thing we do on a Sunday, we worked out, we need about, ideally, we want about 20 people serving on a Sunday morning. Let's forget about the evenings for just a moment. Sunday morning, if we have 20 people serving, that's a good number. That gives us enough for the band, the sound, the um, children's church, all of the different things that need to be done and set up and made ready so that everyone can enjoy the service. We're probably about 100 adults on the premises this morning. Four weeks in a month, 20 a morning is 80 service slots across a month. Just breaking this down, really practical for some of us. If every one of us signed up to serve somewhere, we would all be serving once a month. I'm sure most of us can say, one Sunday a month, I'm going to build. One Sunday a month, I can be at church a little bit earlier and help set up or pack chairs or be in the band or do whatever it may be. One Sunday a month, I can help with children's church. One Sunday a month, some of us maybe even, hey, I can do this two Sundays a month. God bless you. We love you. What we're not saying is we want you to do this all the day, every day might be stirring in some of your hearts, and if something like that is stirring, come. but that's not a realistic expectation for most of us. So we want to say, find something where you can serve on a Sunday. On those lists that you'll scan, all of those are Sunday except one, the youth services is a Friday night, where Gareth and Laura lead our youth team, and they're getting a... Um, small group of high school students together, and we're trusting that to grow. If you want to serve it, that's Friday night. Everything else on that list, at least, is Sundays. I wanted to pray about and say, God, where can I serve for the next while? I'm not going to hold you to do this for eternity, but for the next while, I want to be part of building in this way.
And as I said, in a week, we'll give you more information. We don't want you guys to answer that now. Defeats the whole point. Go and pray about it. Say, God, where do you want me to build? And then at the same time, the invitation is open. Somewhere else. One other place. Maybe I want to serve in encounters. I want to help out at Bible school. I want to be involved in student ministry. I want to come and serve in the office. Something during the week that I'm doing. And once again, not every week, all day, Maybe an hour a week, or an hour two weeks, or an hour a month. Whatever it is, whatever you have capacity. We take hands like that. We're going to continue to build something that brings glory to Jesus. Three things I want us to pray for this week. How are we as a church? God, give us grace to build people and to build them better. Give us grace to build with people, to build community, Lord Jesus, to build uh, structure as... <laughs> Yes, the, as the Bible calls it, there, to put structure, Lord, together for your name's sake. And then thirdly, God, what is my role in this building, God? Fortunately, God isn't calling any of us to do everything. Some of us overachievers, we need to throw that little weight off. God's not calling you to do everything. He really isn't. But I believe he is calling you to do something. I want to invite you to put your hand up for whatever that something might be. If we can't do everything, we can do something. Amen. Has everyone got elements of the communion this morning? Anyone been missed? Great stuff. Can we stand as we pray and as we partake of communion? Jesus, this morning, God, we're just a new aware of the power of the cross of Christ, Lord. Lord, even as we sang just a little bit earlier, you are welcome here, Lord. You're welcome in our lives. and The only reason we can say that, we can even think that, Lord, that the only reason it's possible, Jesus, for you to step into our lives is because of the cross, Lord, because our sin was taken away. And so we want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you broke your body so that we could be made whole. That you broke your body so that your church can be built, Lord. You broke your body so that I can be built as an individual, Jesus. You broke your body so that I can come together with other people, Lord Jesus, who are being built and we can be built together into a glorious temple for your name. Lord, all of these beautiful things we dream of and we pray about that we want to see you doing in lives, Lord. It's your body that was broken that made it possible, Jesus. And so this morning, again, we lay our brokenness down, Lord. Our weakness, Lord. Our simonness, our being a reed, Lord. Our lack of character, our failure. Lord, we lay it down at the foot of the cross. And we take up the grace that you pour out for us to be made whole. Grace for new life. Grace for hope and peace and joy. Grace that you make us, Lord. Everything we're not, everything that we need to be, you make us by the power of the cross. And so, Jesus, this morning, we thank you for your broken body. Let's eat together. And Jesus, thank you for your blood. Your blood which washes every single sin away. Thank you, Jesus, that this morning there is not a single sin that is stronger than the power of your blood. Lord, there is not a string, single stronghold or a chain or a shackle that your blood is weaker than. And so we call on your blood to wash, to cleanse, and to set us free. That we can step into liberty because of the blood of Jesus, Lord. Blood that speaks and speaks of life and hope. Blood that invigorates and strengthens, Lord. And blood that overcomes the power of darkness. Blood that calls us into life. Thank you, Jesus, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And you gave your blood to make atonement for our souls. 
Lord, we don't really get what that means, but we say thank you for it, Lord. Thank you that every single one of our sins is washed away by the blood of Jesus. Let's drink together. And Jesus, as your body was broken and your blood was shed, you built your church. And we are eternally thankful that you have been doing that and continue to do that. And so I pray in this week, Lord, as we continue to fast, as we pray, that Jesus, you would build us as living stones. Every one of us, build us, Lord. Build us into the shape of into the stone that most glorifies you, Lord. And as you do that, Lord, we make ourselves available to be built with. Lord, put us where you want us to be, God. We know there's a specific design and a specific building where we will fit, Lord, where you've planned for us to be. We want to be exactly there, Lord. We open up our hearts to say, Jesus, put us there. And Jesus, give us grace that like Paul, we may build well upon the foundation of Jesus. We pray all of this, Lord, in, in your name. Amen. Thanks for listening to this message from Shofar Christian Church. We believe that you enjoyed your time with us, establishing God's kingdom and His glory in your life. For more info, call us on 012-362-1363. Email us, pretoria at shofaronline.org. Browse our website, www.shofaronline.org. Or like us on facebook.com forward slash shofarpretoria.